Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mary Jane Burke. You might be able to tell this one's Dr. Willis. Um, I just want to express my thanks to all of you. I want you to be aware that we have about 60,000 um, students and ch young children in our community. And on behalf of each and every one of them, thank you for being here. Um, we are definitely in a situation in our community, um, here in Marin County, in our state, in our nation, that we have to do more. Uh, and we have to do more to ensure that we are supporting every single one of our students and children, as well as their families and the broader community. And as you all know, we can't do this together. The situations that our children and students are in are very, very dire. They're very, very serious. Um, they are life-threatening. And we must do all we can individually and collectively. And I want to speak just a bit about the collectively part. Um, being able to ensure that we are supporting families and children is something that we can't do alone. Not one of us here can do it alone, and not one agency can do it alone. And so here in Marin County, the fact that we have so many strong, high-functioning, highly effective, courageous, and passionate partners is making all the difference. But we still have so much more to do. And so please um, enjoy this evening. You will learn so much from these amazing men about the trials, the tribulations, the successes. And you'll walk out that door being more informed and more able to cope and support each other as well as others in our community. So thank you for being here. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to the most amazing public health officer that exists really truly anywhere in the country. He's there when we need him, uh, regardless of the issue, is willing to take strong leadership when many others are ducking the issues. And that's our public health officer, Matthew Willis. So here he is. Thank you, Mary Jane. Thank you, Mary Jane. It's, it's always intimidating to share the stage with Mary Jane Burke. Um, and I'm never sure whether or not our team in public health is doing more for the public health of this community or Mary Jane's team for all that they do to ensure that our schools are, are places of, of health and well-being and not just learning. Um, so on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services and RX Safe Marin, I want to welcome all of you. And thank you for being here for what is probably one of the most important conversations we could be having as a community. Um, Marin County has been ranked the healthiest county in the state of California nine out of the last ten years by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We're ranked a, a, about you know, a bunch of different indicators of health, about 30 different indicators, and we rank near the top in almost all of them with two notable exceptions, and they're food for thought. The first is income inequality. We have some of the largest differences between the haves and the have-nots of any community, um, and that's an important conversation, but for another night. The other deficit is in substance use. We have higher rates of DUI, adult binge drinking, and drug overdose than most other California communities. Um, we know that um, this epidemic, this crisis of opioids and, and methamphetamine use has been termed an epidemic. In public health, we're thinking, of, we often think of epidemics in terms of infectious diseases. Um, measles, tuberculosis, and certainly that's been my experience working for the CDC before I came to Marin. The way we approach those kinds of epidemics is by I identifying cases and isolating them and treating them and making sure they're not being exposed to other people until they've been treated. What's important about this epidemic of substance use is that we're flipping that model completely and we're learning that isolation of people who are struggling with substance use, whether it's through fear whether it's through stigma, shame, or ignorance, is actually accelerating this epidemic. And so the solutions for us are connectivity. The antidote is connections. And so the relationships that we're able to form and actually rally around people who are struggling with this illness and the coming together as a community is in fact part of the solution. So I hope that we recognize that we're here tonight for enriching ourselves and hearing from these amazing speakers, but also recognize that we are in fact tonight part of the solution of this issue because we need to be coming together as a community. So with that, I will be um, introducing our three speakers. Um, David Sheff, well, I'll start with 
with Michael Krasny. It's intimidating to introduce people that you admire so much and have heard on the radio almost every day on your way to work. <laughs> um, Michael Krasny has been the host of KQED Forum for 26 years and has been in broadcast journalism since 1983. He's been a professor of English at San Francisco State University and taught at Stanford, University of San Francisco, University of California, and the Fulbright International Institutes. Michael is the author of several books, including Off Mic, a memoir of talk radio and literary life, Spiritual Envy, Sound Ideas, and Let There Be Laughter. He is a longtime resident of Marin. Nick Sheff is the author of Tweak, Growing Up on Methamphetamine, We All Fall Down, Living with Addiction, and the novel Schizo. Nick travels around the country speaking to young adults about drug use and is co-author with his father, David, of High, Everything You Want to Know About Drugs, Alcohol, and Addiction. Nick now works as a writer for television and film. He was, producer of 13, he was a producer of 13 Reasons Why and writer of Recovery Road and The Killing. Nick lives in Los Angeles with his wife and two dogs, <laughs> Ramona and Rhett Butler, and grew up in Marin. David Sheff is the author of Beautiful Boy, a father's journey through his son's addiction, a number one New York Times bestseller, which won a special award from the American Psychological Association for outstanding contribution to the understanding of addiction. In 2009, David was named Time Magazine's, on Time Magazine's list of the world's most influential people. David also wrote, Clean, Overcoming Addiction, and Ending America's Greatest Tragedy, and High with his son, Nick. His new book, The Buddhist on Death Row, How One Man Found Light in the Darkest Place, will be released in May. David recently launched the Beautiful Boy Fund, devoted to making quality, evidence-based treatment available to people who need it, and supporting research to further the field of addiction medicine. Nick and David's books were adapted into the movie, Beautiful Boy. Before Michael, David, and Nick come join us on the stage, we're going to show the trailer for that movie, and much of it was filmed here in Marin. Oh, wow. <laughs> so how you doing? I'm doing great, you know, just, um, um, just doing what needs to be done. And what does that mean? I'm sorry, Dad, um... Why don't we just have lunch and talk? We can do that, right? Mm. Please. You think that you have this under control. I understand why I do things. It doesn't make me any different. You're just embarrassed because I was like, you know, I was like this amazing thing, like your special creation or something, and you don't like who I am now. Yeah, who are you, Nick? This is me, Dad, here, this is who I am. This is not you. This is not you, Nick. What are you doing, huh? You always gotta be controlling everything all the time. Let me, let me book your room no, at a hotel for a no, couple of nights. Dad. I don't want it to go like this. My son has gone missing. Nicholas Sheff, S-H-E-F-F. -F. There's no one by that name, sir. There are moments that I look at him, this kid that I raised, who I thought I knew inside and out, and I wonder who he is. I thought we were close. I thought we were closer than most fathers Wait, and sons. Yeah. Why? I felt better than I ever had, so I just kept on doing it. This oh, isn't no, us. No. This is not who we just are. Me. My son is out there somewhere, and I don't know what he's doing. I don't know how to help him. You can't. I don't feel like I have a disease. This isn't like cancer. This is my choice. I put myself here. I failed. I can't do it alone. I need to find a way to fill this black hole in me. I still have a family. I want them to be proud of me. What you have, you're going to find it again. You're going to get it back. Do you know how much I love you? I love you more than everything. I love everything. 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 Yay. <laughs> Nick, 
Nick, David, and Michael, please join us on the stage. Thank you. <laughs> History with them goes back quite a way. I do a program on KQED. Not hearing me. Okay. <laughs> We have some technical difficulties here, obviously, this evening. Um, let me say again, uh, I'm Michael Krasny of KQED Radio, and I'm pleased to be here with both David and Nick, who I have a history with that goes back to having them on my radio program. It's the morning program on KQED Radio called Forum. And I knew them actually before the books were out and before the movie was out and uh, before they've gained this acclaim and fame, deservedly so. And I wanted to talk with them and give those of you in the audience an opportunity to ask questions as well. We have questions that were simply collected before even you even came in this evening. Many of you put these questions down, and we'll get to as many as we can. But I wanted to begin, I'm going to begin by you, Nick, talking with you, Nick. And it's quite a saga, their story. I mean, both of them went through hell. I think I don't have to say that. And to some extent, there's a real happy ending to this, but it go, the struggle goes on, and it's always something that they do that's remarkable in the way of educating the public and educating not only teens but parents as to what they need to know about addiction and how to fight addiction and how to not get in the traps that addiction really can entangle you in. So Nick, I'm gonna begin with you and we've talked a lot about and you've written a lot about your own struggles with self-esteem and your own feeling of peer pressure and all those things that we almost think are de rigueur when it comes to struggles that go on before one falls into the habits that you fell into. I wouldn't even call them habits, but really the kind of possession that you had, a demonic possession, some might almost say. So you're talking to a parent. There are parents in the audience tonight. Let's, let's do a little kind of what they used to call psychodrama here. You've got a parent, and you have to emphasize one thing particularly in terms of prevention. You had your own struggles, but try to universalize it as best you can. What would you say to that parent, or those parents, let's in fact make it parents, about saving their child from falling in their teenager or whatever from falling into the kind of things that unfortunately you struggled with um well thank you michael um that is a tough question to start with but um that's a good question. i don't mess around you know that yeah, yeah. no it's a good question and um and thank you guys all for being here um i guess it, i feel like there's almost there's kind of two sides to that question a little bit which one is like the addiction thing which um you know for me growing up I didn't know anything about addiction. I wasn't taught um, about the fact that you know addiction is a disease. That it's a lot of times it can be um, uh, you know, there could be a genetic component to the disease. You know, my grandfather on my mom's side um, drank himself to death literally, and there's alcoholism going back in her family for generations. Um, but I, I didn't know what that meant. So you know, when I was um, 11 and um, a friend offered me some pot and I um, smoked it for the first time. You know, I had this very immediate uh, sense of, of relief. And, you know, it's like where you were talking about, like, oh, I'd always felt, um, you know, really bad about myself and just anxious and insecure. And um, smoking pot, it, it made me feel better. And so let um, me just jump in for a moment because yeah. pot uh, in that time and maybe even still. It's kind of de-emphasized. It's not really that terrible a drug, and, and as most people used to see it and still do. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, that, I think that was why I did it without really thinking about it, because it felt like everyone was doing it around me, and um, and I didn't think it would be a problem. But um, the, but the moment I did it, it gave me such an intense feeling of relief that um, I ended up really becoming dependent on it very quickly, because um, I became dependent on that feeling that it gave me. And I think that is partially because I had this uh, genetic predisposition. But I'll ask you an even tougher question, if I can jump yeah, on that. Yeah. We'll get to maybe your answer to yeah, the initial yeah, no question. Problem. But what, do you, what can you find, really? Or is there anything you can find that can give you that feeling that doesn't involve substances? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing that I really wish, looking back, is that I wish when I was a young person I would have had the wherewithal to reach out and ask for help because if I think if I, I, I mean I know that if I told people, I've seen it with other young people who have done exactly this, when they realize that they, um, they are feeling you know uncomfortable in their own skin and insecure and 
they look around at all their friends and they feel like their friends have it so together and they don't feel that way at all and they ask for help. There are professionals out there um, who are really incredible about helping young people to help them um, build the skills that they need in order to um, heal those, those feelings inside and um, to really start to learn how to love and accept themselves and to find joy in um, you know, just sort of the simple things of life that I've learned to find joy in now, like just, you know, hanging out with friends or hanging out with my dogs or, um, you know, going to the beach or whatever. Um, I mean, that's been the amazing thing about sobriety for me is learning to have find joy in those things. But I could have had that when I was a young person, I know, if I'd been able to ask for help because I've seen that there are people working in all these communities that um, really are doing incredible work to um, help young people to, um, to find that within themselves. Um, so, so I think the answer to the question is, if you need help, if you think you need help, find it, get it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think for parents, you know, I would say that's the other thing is, I, I think it's important to educate people about, you know, young people about the disease of addiction. And, you know, it's about 10% of the population that has it. So it's like one in 10 people. Um, and, you know, just if there's a history of addiction in the family or, um, you know, sort of, I don't know, it's, I think there's, it's really important to um, educate young people about the dangers that they may face if they have a, a family member that's an addict. Um, but then the other side of it, too, is I think, um, you know, uh, young people are taught, I think, that because of the way that adults act, that the only way that we can sort of interact with each other or have fun with each other is by putting some kind of substance into our body. Like if we go to a party, we need to drink. If we go to a concert, we need to smoke pot. And I think it's a really dangerous thing to teach young people. And it's really sad too, because you know, I just remember when I was growing up, I felt like I couldn't hang out with my friends unless we had pot or we, had, we were gonna be able to drink. And, um, you know, I, 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 I think it's something that it doesn't need to be that way. Like, young people can learn how to have relationships with each other and, um, and you know, really have fun with each other and, and, um, and relate to each other without needing some kind of substance to But forgive me, body. Nick, I want to go to David, yeah. but it takes a great deal of strength sometimes, doesn't it, to say, no, I'm not going to participate. I don't want to use these substances because you're having pressure to use them. I think that is true for sure, and they've done studies that say that um, the younger someone starts using drugs and alcohol, the more likely they are to um, develop a dependency later on. So I think that's another thing for parents is to really um, help their kids to plan and strategize about how they will be able to say no in situations. Um, but you know, I, I think for me, uh, there was an element of peer pressure there for sure because there were people around me that were drinking and smoking pot, but. It really, the thing that was driving me was the feeling in myself that I just felt like I hated myself and I, I couldn't stand being with myself. And when I take put these substances into my body, that feeling would go away, at least at first. And so um, I think helping young people to build this, you know, to build these skills, to learn how to, yeah, love themselves, accept themselves, feel whole within themselves. I think that does so much in terms of sort of arming them against that temptation that's out there. So David, you're talking to somebody like Nick, except much younger than Nick was when he got addicted. What do you tell them? I mean, you were a loving father. You cared deeply and profoundly about your son's health and about getting him on what they used to call the straight and narrow and so forth. So let's universalize it again. What would you tell a parent or parents about what they could do to avoid that road and avoid going down that path? Uh, it's hard. Uh, we live in a time that is very challenging for parents. No, I don't have to tell you that. Um, I guess that what I did, and I would caution other people to do, uh, not to do, is I did what I think so many parents do, and maybe it's even more true here in a place like Marin County. Uh, I was looking at the external barometers of what tells us, you know, a, a parent, how our child is doing, and according to those, you know, Nick was doing great. You know, his teachers always reinforced that. You know, he's a great student, he has a lot of friends, he was, you know, an athlete, he was on the school newspaper, he was in a play, all those kinds of things. Uh, and what I didn't you were see- You really, weren't you? And I was gonna say, what I didn't see is what he talks about now, that he was actually suffering inside. And so, 
you know, why do people take drugs? I mean, that's the big question. Um, part of it is peer pressure, you know, that you mentioned. It's, I think it's about experimenting as well. But I think the real reason that most kids use drugs, there's actually, you know, there was this big survey of 7,000 high school students around the country. They asked the students and they asked the parents, you know, why the, par the parents said, why do you think kids take drugs? They asked the students why they or their friends or they think takes drugs. Um, the parents thought it was going to be number one. Number two, c clearly, that the kids would say the same thing was peer pressure and because it feels good. Uh, they asked the high school students and the researchers said they expected the exact same answers and that's not what they said. They said that the number one reason that they get high um, is because of stress. It's because of stress. So that gives us a lot of information. If there's a relationship between stress and drug use, the question is what's stressing our kids out and what we can do to mitigate that stress. Is this as simple in some ways as the uh, need for kids to come forward and communicate to their parents and the parents to be receptive to that or maybe to be not so taken in by Because kids can be very good at masquerading and hiding and concealing what they're doing in terms of substances, obviously. Well, Nick was never good at that, <laughs> at hiding. Well, that's part of your I always story. knew uh, from the beginning he was very forthright. No, um, I think you're right. And I think uh, it's, you know, we are, are, maybe it's even cliche to say that parents aren't given a manual about how, you know, what we're supposed to do. And I was actually talking, I've been doing some work at San Quentin, and I've been talking to this group of guys who are there, and many of them are there for their whole lives. They, they did terrible things. But that night I was actually going to speak, it was a while ago, I was going to go speak at Drake High School that night with a bunch of students. And so I was sitting with these guys who, and I said, you know, I'm going to talk to these high school kids tonight. Is there anything that you would recommend that I say? Or is there anything anybody could have said to you that might have made a difference in your life? And, you know, the guys, they went around and they had some very interesting things to say. This one guy who'd been quiet said, you know, I, 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 he said, you're asking what we, you know, what you should say to the kids? He said, don't say anything to them, listen. And I think that that is a really powerful lesson, is that we want to be able to understand what our kids are going through. We have to be able to talk with them. They have to feel safe talking to us. They have to realize that we're not going to judge them. We're not going to punish them. Um, our, that's our jobs, I feel like, is to help them negotiate a really, really tough time of life. But you're speaking in many ways to a kind of attitude that a lot of parents don't have. And a lot of children are frankly frightened to come to their parents and admit that they're getting involved in drugs. I mean, you've been out there as an educator talking to so many parents and kids and everything. I'm sure you recognize that a lot of kids are terrified. Uh, they should find out and it's going to be me who's suffering and they'll be so unhappy and they'll be so disappointed in me and I'll feel like a failure. Yeah, I think that that's right. But that's part of, I think, that the inherent problem in the way that we have treated drug use and drug addiction in this culture. Uh, is that it is this black and white thing that the good kids are the ones who don't use, the bad kids are the ones who do use. Um, we judge them, we punish them, sometimes you know, we arrest them. Um, instead, you know, we realize these aren't bad good kids, they're our kids, we want to help them in every single way, and we want to make it safe for them to be able to have those conversations. Um, no judgment. We want to know what's going on you know, in, in their lives. We want them to be open. That is the number one way to keep kids healthy and safe, whether it's about drug use and drug addiction, or whether it's about, um, you know, other kinds of, you know, school-related problems or related to, um, we want to be able to have these kinds of relationships with them. So we're, we'll know what they're struggling with. Maybe it's not drugs. Maybe they're worried about other kids. Maybe they're experiencing depression. Maybe they're experiencing bullying, cyberbullying, whatever it is. They're feeling isolated. They're having a hard time learning. Whatever it is, um, the more we can connect with them and make it safe for them to talk to us. Um, you know, it's not... It, all these things are easy to say. It's hard. You're right. Being a parent is hard, and having that is hard. It's hard for these for kids too. You know, I'm old enough to remember um, when Ronald Reagan was president, and he was married to a first lady named Nancy Reagan, who said, "Just say no." That was her message to youth, and that was her message to kids who might be dragooned into or fall into the trap of drugs and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, and I'd like to go to you on Nick, that it's very hard to say no. And how do you build up, really, the kind of strengths? I mean, you can look at this in terms of your own difficulties and your own challenges and so forth, but how, does, uh, how do parents help, and, and David, I think, was hinting and intimating a lot of this, building up those strengths, building up the kind of defenses, really, that are needed against being able to say yes as opposed to <laughs> being able to say no to drugs as opposed to just being falling into traps? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question, too, but I think, um, I mean, the, the thing is, like, obviously there are some 
drugs that I think we as a society do need to just say no to, like crystal meth. No one needs to be doing crystal meth. Like it's just a gross, disgusting drug and, you know, heroin or whatever. But, you know, when you get to like pot and alcohol, that, you know, it's more complicated. Or ecstasy. Um, uh. Yeah, ec ec I mean, that's more complicated too, I guess, even though that is kind of gross too. But um, at least just mine from my experience. But, um, uh, but I think the thing is for young people, I mean, like I was saying, um, you know, the really dangerous thing with, for young people when they start uh, relying on drugs and alcohol as a way to sort of feel okay with at parties or feel okay within themselves or feel like they need that in order to socialize is you stop building the skills that you would otherwise be building if you weren't relying on drugs and alcohol. Like, I remember when I, um, you know, first went into treatment when I was uh, 18 and, um, you know, I was trying to be sober but I'd literally, I'd never, I'd never had to deal with any of the emotions that I was suddenly having to deal with. I'd never had to learn how to deal with rejection or success even or, or failure or, you know, anything because I just always smoked pot or drank whenever I felt anything. Um, so helping young people to really um, learn how to, uh, you know, build those coping skills, I guess, and um, to really help them to sort of build a solid foundation so that when they're older, you know, if they want to, you know, smoke pot occasionally or drink occasionally or whatever, like that's, we're not saying like all this stuff is black and white, but um, there really is something that I think is very sad, like I was saying, that we live in a culture where people feel like they need these substances in order to relate to one another. And so I think if when people are young and when their brains are developing, when they're learning, um, or when they should be learning these sort of skills of how to deal with life on life's terms, um, if they're using this shortcut of drugs and alcohol at that point, you know, that's when it can be really damaging. So I think just really encouraging sort of a more holistic uh, sort of way of raising our kids so that, you know, we're not so focused on whether their test scores are perfect or they're getting, you know, the perfect grades or playing a million sports and a million extracurricular activities, but we're really focused on helping them to learn how to um, become full, you know, uh, self-sufficient, but also um, happy and whole people. I think that's what we, that's the goal of life. And I think that's, as a parent, you know, as a future parent for me, I guess, about, since I probably will be a parent at some point, um, you know, that's what I really would want for well, you my You mentioned kids. joy. Uh, I mean, you, you know, to get active in so many things is really what you're talking about. It's so important. But I'm struck by the fact that when I mean, you're saying you were going to be a parent, that you have said on a couple of occasions already, it's a disease and it's something that I inherited. It's in my gen genetic makeup. Um, you can use things like that as an excuse, can't you? You can say, you know, first of all, this is making me feel good, so that's what I need to do. I don't want to feel bad. But also, I come by it by my heredity. Uh, so I don't necessarily have to take as much responsibility for it. Isn't that a danger? I, I, I guess you could look at it that way, but I actually feel like it, in some ways it's sort of the opposite because I always, um, I, I, the reason that looking at it as a disease was so important for me was because I kept thinking that there was some way that I would be able to um, control my drinking or using. Like I felt like if I could get my life in order, like, you know, halfway through writing um, my first book, Tweak, I had this horrible relapse, and it was, a lot of it was because I think I um, was like, oh, I'm doing better now, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a book deal, like, I'm pu putting my life together, and so I tried, you know, just smoking pot again to see if that would work for me. But what I needed to understand, or what I didn't understand about myself then, but I know now, is that because I have the disease of addiction, whenever I put a mind-altering substance into my body, this invisible switch gets flipped and it becomes almost impossible for me to stop. I mean, it, it, it just, I can't like, I mean, I, I've experienced it so many times where I think like, oh, I'm just gonna try drinking because I never really had a problem with drinking. So I'll have one, you know, beer or whatever. And in my mind, I just cannot, I don't even know how to describe it exactly, but it's like, I can't stop thinking about it. Like, I'm just constantly thinking about when am I gonna be able to drink more? When am I gonna get to have it again? And then, you know, within a week, I was drinking, you know, at that time when I tried just drinking, I was drinking so much that I was embarrassed about it around my girlfriend at the time and I was hiding bottles around the house and waking up in the morning and sneaking, you know, straight vodka and I mean it just, it, it literally happened every single time. So for me knowing that I'm a kind of person that for whatever reason, you know, my brain chemistry, they, I guess scientists say they're very close to being able to um, identify like a specific 
allele on a gene or so, I don't know science stuff, but something like that that will um, be able to you know predetermine potentially whether someone has this gene of addiction or alcoholism. I, I just know 100% that I have it. So it's better for your defense against the addiction then. And yeah, the absolutely. That's what you're saying, and yeah. and I've just I, I you know there's no other way to describe it to me. It is it's it's it's. Um, you know, it's like having, it's a brain disease. So it's like when I'm also bipolar and, um, you know, when I go off my, when I've tried going off my uh, medication for that, you know, it, it, it's out of my control. Like I suddenly am, you know, have like a thousand dollar phone bill because I'm calling everyone constantly all 24 hours a day or whatever. I mean, I just act crazy. And, um, you know, it, it's, it, and in a way it's nice to know like, okay, I have bipolar disorder, so then I can treat it. I have the disease of addiction so then I can treat it. And I think that's something that's really important too, is learning to treat this thing, you know, as you would treat any other disease, where you find a doctor, um, you find the right help that you would need, and um, you do all, the, you know, take all these steps that you need to take to treat this thing, and that makes it, you know, manageable. And David, um, what about education? You two have been on kind of a mission to make young people aware of different drugs and the effects they have and see the whole trajectory of what can happen with addiction. How important is education and when should it start from your experience? Well, there's no, uh, it, it can never start too early. Uh, kids, a lot of times parents will say, you know, I've got these young kids, I, uh, when do I start talking to them about it? But young kids, once kids are in school, they're hearing stuff. They've got older, some, if they don't have older siblings, somebody else does, they're starting to hear about drugs. And if we don't talk to them about it, somebody is going to, and they're going to get information that probably is inaccurate, and it's going to be really confusing, and it can be really scary. Um, you know, it's why uh, there's nothing good that you can say about the current crisis where, you know, so many people are dying. I, I just learned that the number one ex cause of accidental death in Marin is overdose. I mean, there's nothing we can say about that. I meet people all the time. Every single day I, t I communicate with people who've uh, lost their children uh, to to this. That's so horrible, but it doesn't necessarily yeah. scare young people because they think they're somehow invincible and their brain hasn't fully developed. And I don't mean that in any insulting no, way. I, That's a fact. Yeah, well, I guess what I'm saying is that that there's that this horror, the one thing it has done is it has done this. It's brought everyone together to talk about this problem. Um, and we haven't in the past. You know, like you said, you know, we when I grew up, <laughs> Wasn't that different, I think, you know, when Michael, when Nick, with, uh, probably many people here, just say no, Nancy Reagan, you know, a, pol a police officer coming up in front of us and telling us not to do drugs and we were in the back of the room, hi, you know, we, it didn't work. And so that's why this current crisis is bringing people together to have conversations like this because a community like Moran, I mean, people talk about, you know, the, the added risk, the, the higher uh, numbers of people who, in Marin uh, have drug addiction related problems. Suicide is high here, um, but it's true, you know, everywhere it's pervasive. And, um, and yeah, excuse me, a lot of the problem is, you know, parents are drinking and using pot and so forth. And yeah. the message is don't do what I do, but do what I say. And that's a message that gets very conflicted in young it people's is. minds. I'm also inclined to ask you about, I just had Susan Rice on this morning, uh, who's written a book called Tough Love, it's a memoir. She was uh, representative of the United Nations and a national security advisor for President Barack Obama. Tough love was a concept that many people felt was necessary. That is, you have to say to your kid, okay, you're gonna do this, I'm gonna just let you cut you loose. I'm not gonna be there for you. I'm not gonna have your back. How radical is that and how, I mean, you went through that whole dialectic, didn't you? Yeah, and by the way, the interview this morning with Rice was fantastic. That's all, I mean, come on. We, Nick and I travel a lot around the country, and whenever I do, I get like a rent a car or something, and I find the local public station. And so I'm always trying to hear, you know, their local talk radio shows, and it just, I just makes me, every single time I realize how lucky we are. We have, um, you know, just this person who edifies us every single day. It's true, I'm not just saying it. But let me get you back to tough love. That's okay. a very nice view. Well, to say, it's true, but I guess the point there is that I think that tough love, the idea is it's really confusing to people. Uh, when Nick finally went out, um, when I finally admitted or accepted the fact that he had a drug problem, that he was going to die if we didn't figure this out, uh, he left 
the home one, well, he left home one night and didn't come back, and we didn't see him for three days. And over the course of that time, I tried to figure out what do you do if you have a child with a drug problem, a serious drug problem. And one of the things I did is I called therapists, I called treatment professionals, I called uh, counselors, and a lot of them told me that there's nothing you can do. You have to let a person who has a drug problem hit bottom uh, and figure out themselves that they need help and they're desperate and they somehow crawl into some treatment program or something like that and they finally stop. You have to practice tough love. Um, and it was really confusing because to me it was finally when Nick, I found Nick, he was in San Rafael and an alley and he looked like he was going to die and I just got him home and they're telling me I have to kick him out. It made no sense. I had to practice tough love. And what I have learned is that um, it is a really dangerous message that we give to people in, in our culture, parents and others. Um, when somebody's sick, we don't want to let them hit bottom. We want to embrace them. We want to treat them with compassion. We want to get them help as soon as possible. And the thing that reinforces that to me all the time is when I hear from parents who, our dad said it as well as anybody could ever say it. He said, I'd been through this. My child had been in rehab over and over again. And I kept hearing uh, that I had to practice tough love. And finally, nothing else had worked, so I did it. My daughter called me up. Uh, I said, you know, I love you, but good luck. And hung up the phone. Let me hear from you when you're so sober. And um, the next phone call he got, of course, was from the police saying his daughter had overdosed and died. And he said, you know, was my love tough enough? Um, it's hard, and we don't want to do things that we know that are going to encourage drug use and allow drug use to flourish, but at the same time, we have to recognize the fact that if somebody we love has this illness, uh, we don't want to shut the door. We want to embrace them. We want to do everything we can to support them. Yeah, and maybe we can talk a little bit about how you support them, particularly when there's just this descent into the abyss, because you tried almost everything, and you were certainly, I think, totally a loving parent as much as you could be. You wanted Nick to get well, and you were fighting dragons. I mean, in some ways, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that they're both sitting up there. And Nick, by the way, let me just say, has been clean now for a whole gestation of about nine months, and I think that really deserves it. Nine years. Point. Nine years, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something happened I didn't know? <laughs> I know, that made my... Nine months would be worthy of applause, yeah, too, but it's, it is nine years. Let's make no mistake about that. Um, I mean, you've both fought valiantly, and I really, my head... And admiration and respect goes uh, to both of you. But like I said earlier on, you've been through hell and uh, come out. Not many people necessarily can come out this clean and this fortunate. Yeah, we're lucky. There's no way around it. I mean, Nick will tell you, and I experienced from a father's perspective that he came as close to dying many times. I got calls from emergency room doctors who told me, you know, Mr. Chef, you better get down here. We have your son. We don't know if he's going to make it. Um, and now, you know, the statistics, 200 people are dying every single day, so 200 parents are losing their children. Uh, it's horrific when... Um, I was thinking about nine months, by the way, because I just found out my daughter's pregnant, maybe that's... <laughs> <laughs> you almost gave me a heart attack. Yeah. It's like, did something happen something that, you that didn't I didn't know, right? know about? <laughs> uh, Do you have to go full bore, Nick? Do you have to say, I'm not going to... There's a, there's a word, it's a fancy word, abstemious. I'm just going to avoid entirely any kind of alcohol, any kind of, even an occasional joint here and there. Uh, do you have to completely go clean? I do, yeah. I, I, I mean, um, I do, but I, I mean, I also like, uh, it, it just makes, I mean, I guess just, I feel like there's like 500 things I want to say after what you're saying, but um, just in terms of, um, you know, we are really, really hugely lucky, and especially, you know, with the opiate um, epidemic that's going on right now and this fentanyl, like, I think if I was a drug user now, I would be dead. Like, it is unbelievable how strong these drugs are, how dangerous they are, and it just takes, you know, one pill, one fake oxy that you think is an oxy that's fentanyl, to kill someone, um, so I, we are really lucky. But I also will say that you know I, I live in um, LA now. And I have this huge uh, community of people who are also sober. I mean, I've met you know uh, maybe thousands, tens of thousands of people all across the country who are living these like incredible lives sober. And um, you know, the, my doctor said this thing to me the other day that I thought was really cool. She said. The reason she loves working with addicts is because if you work with someone with a with a regular disease, 
um, you know, like cancer or something, you know, you can cure the person of cancer, which is amazing, and their life will go back to the way that it was before, and, and, and that's a miracle, that's incredible. But she loves working with addicts because when someone gets sober, it's not just that their life goes back to the way that it was before they started using, their life gets so much better than it ever had been before, and she loves watching that process. And for me, that has so been the case, and, and, and not even just for me, for all my friends um, in the recovery community, like I, I, almost everyone that I'm really close with is someone, you know, is another man who's sober and who um, we all have these, you know, incredible lives and we have kids and we go surfing together and um, give each other a lot of support too, don't you? Give each other That's a lot a of support. Yeah. And, um, and it's just amazing to see, you know, this isn't a death sentence. It's not the end of, you know, it's not like a consolation prize to be sober. It feels like joining the winning team in a lot of ways, which that feels incredible. And I, I hope that that hopeful message goes out there. Congratulations for being on the winning team and stay yeah. there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let me go to some questions that came from many of you in the audience. And there are questions for both Nick and David, and we'll go to as many as we can. Um, first for you, Nick, what might have had a positive impact on you and your use when you were a teenager? I think you've kind of outlined that for yeah, us. Yeah, I think, yeah, just, um, I definitely feel like, you know, in er earlier intervention, um, I think if I'd talked to, um, you know, someone who understood what I was going through, I, I think I could have, you know, been able, I, I would have been able to uh, ask for help a little earlier. Um, I don't know if we, t I don't think we talked about this, but I actually got caught with pot um, when I was in seventh grade at the Marin Waldorf School, and um, I got in trouble of course, and they called my dad, and then when my dad expressed concern about it, the teacher basically, my teacher basically said, you know, don't worry about it, you know, all the kids do it, it's, it's no big deal. Yeah, exactly. yeah. and, um, you know, looking back, I wish that that teacher had said, why is a seventh grader smoking pot, like, you should really think about, you know, getting him, you know, at least some in to talk to somebody, get some help, um, I think that would have been in fact, it leads right to the next question for your father. Um, we do live in a very laid-back community here, and drugs are taken maybe too much for granted. And here's a question for you from someone who says, what advice do you have for parents in Marin specifically where there is often a general acceptance that youth will experiment with alcohol and drugs? Uh, you know, where, do, where does that lead if, they, if we make that assumption? I mean, it's not going to be surprising um, that our kids are trying drugs. And of course, a lot of times they also look to us as being role models. And, um, you know, if we're getting high, if we're, I mean, one of these fallacies I hear from parents sometimes is like, I'm going to have a party at our house and let the kids come here and get high because I don't want them out, you know, on the streets or where it's dangerous. I mean, all of those things basically are just giving permission and giving validation to the idea that people are, um, that kids are going to use. Uh, and I think instead of that, um, you know, our values matter and our kids learn from us, uh, and both by example and also because, because as in the kinds of, you know, the, our kinds of expectations and the conversations. Um, and then it goes back to this other piece, which is how can we help our kids grow up at a time when it is really stressful? And when we can recognize that, and so, so much of the conversation I feel like is, you know, we talk about drugs, we say don't do drugs, we try to figure out how to educate kids about drugs, it's all important, uh, and parents about drugs. But really it is a lot of times, for instance, um, we know that Nick talked about the genetic component of addiction, but also we know that kids who have other problems, depression, anxiety, just, you know, Nick talked about his bipolar disorder, if somebody has mental illness, they're so much more likely to, to um, become addicted to use drugs, it makes sense. You know, it, it, there's, it provides some relief for a while until it makes those things worse. Um, people with learning disabilities are more likely to use uh, eating disorders. People who are having stress at home, whether, whether stress is related to, in some cases, poverty. In some cases, it's because they're not, uh, you know, we live in a culture where there is a lot of pressure on kids to excel. You know, it's a joke, but not a complete joke. Sorry to say, teen suicide rates are at an all-time high, in fact. Uh, yeah, and, and it's, um, you know, what, what message are we giving to our kids? I mean, there really is a culture here that if you're 12 years old and if you haven't filled out your college resumes, you know, you feel like you're going to fail in life. Um, you know, the, it, we were talking about this, but, you know, the big college scandal where parents were paying like $500,000 to get their kids into Yale. I mean, that's nuts, of course. It's illegal and crazy, but it's only, you know, sort of, 
a little bit more than kind of the experience that we're having so like here. So like half it? those parents were from Marin. And half those parents were from Marin. It's, they were. It, it's true. Um, and so what's the message that we're giving to our kids? Do we care about them getting into Stanford or do we care about their mental health, the fact that they can have relationships, the fact that they can, you know, sort of uh, learn to, that we can appreciate them for who they are, not what we want them to be, that we can really pay attention to them, listen to them. I mean, those are the ways I feel like we're going to have the most impact on helping our kids grow up, you know, safely, healthily. Yeah, we have to educate the parents as much, uh, and we're talking about values here. Let me go to some more questions that the audience uh, wanted you to address. Um, actually, um, sort of a related question for you, Nick. Given the permissive and pervasive culture around marijuana and alcohol in Marin County, what's a good advice uh, to Nick with the benefit of your experience um, to navigate? Well, again, we've, we've gone over that to some extent, but here's, let me go to this next question. In your book, you mentioned that pot was the hardest of the drugs for you to quit and that you bought into the lie that it was not addictive nor as harmful as other drugs. Why is it so hard to quit? Um, I think for me personally, why pot was so hard was in some ways because the impact on my life wasn't as obvious as some of the other drugs. Um, it was sort of easier for me to deny the negative impact that it was having on me because it wasn't, you know, making me totally insane like crystal meth. It wasn't making me, you know, sick and throwing up and everything like heroin and and it wasn't, um, you know, and even alcohol, I feel like in some ways was, but um, was sort of, I had more extreme reactions to. Um, so pot, in a way, felt safer or something, but, um, you know, it was the same thing where I just felt like, um, first of all, like I said, I just couldn't stop thinking about it all the time. But also, it just, I realized that, you know, and I, I have friends who smoke pot, you know, every day and, um, you know, work on TV shows with me and stuff. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be judgmental about them or anything, but I see the way that even though they don't realize it, like it is, it is having a negative impact on their life. And, you know, they may be functioning, but they're functioning at a much lower level than they would be otherwise. And, you know, I think the I, I, I'm, you know, I think legalization is really great in a lot of ways, but I think the dangerous thing about it is that somehow that becomes equated with this idea that we've decided as a, you know, as a whole that, that pot is safe and not addictive. Do you do hear these stories about people who use pot, uh, like they have cocktails, you know, and just a, uh, occasional and so forth, and they seem to be highly functioning, and somehow those examples become exemplary in the minds of certain young people who simply say they want to... Um, use it and they they're using it and they're getting along fine you know guys on the football team he's a pothead but you know he seems to be able to play okay another one's a student using a lot of pot what what i think is not really processed in this is the disproportionate number of kids who are affected who slow down and i mean we used to take pot for granted but you know something i told my kids when they were growing up it's a lot stronger than it used to be and not only that but sprayed with sprayed with all kinds of things that it wasn't sprayed with back in the day well, and even those kids that seem like, I mean, my, my friend who worked on the sh show with me that I hope doesn't watch this, but I guess there's no way that he would watch this. Um, but, you know, like it, it, like it can seem like he, like you were saying, like it can seem like, oh, he's not really having any consequences or he's functioning pretty well and stuff. But like I said, I, I, there's something that's really sad about it to me because I know that, you know, there's no reason that you put a substance like that into your body to numb out from the world unless you feel a certain amount of pain at just living with yourself. And if living with yourself feels so unbearable that you need to constantly be putting this, you know, really strong substance in your body to take you out of that, there's something sad about that. So is to it me. bad that it's been legalized? Do you think that no, it's no, become I, a recreational drug? You don't want to go there. Huh? Yeah, no, I, I not, not that I don't. I think it's good. I think it's good. I mean, I don't think people should be put in jail for it. And I think people you know, uh, people can drink socially and people can smoke pot socially, but I'm saying for like, you know, my friend who smokes every day, all day, I think it's really sad. And for young people, I think it really is dangerous. And, you know, I think if I was a parent or when I'm a parent, you know, my goal is just going to be the longer that I can keep my son or daughter from, from using any drugs or alcohol, I think the better. So I'm just, I, cause I know that the longer, um, that, you know, the younger someone starts, the more likely they are to develop an issue later on. And that the longer someone waits, the less likely they are. And the more likely, you know, their brain will have developed in a way that, you know, by the time they do start using or drinking, they're able to make, you know, 
more informed. I'm still observing seventh grade at Waldorf. You know, yeah, yeah, we got an early start. You're going to become you, you're going to become a grandparent very soon. You just said so. Hold on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> put your seatbelt on. Um, what signs, uh, David, do you think indicate to a parent that they need to seek help from a mental health professional? Any shed some um, light on that? Yeah, I think that. Um, uh, there's a pediatrician I know, and basically she said, if you think there's a problem, there's a problem. Um, so if you recognize that a child is isolated, is sad, or is doing something dramatically changed in their lives, if uh, suddenly you know, their, their schoolwork has gone down, if they feel stressed in other ways, if, uh, and the, if, somebody's, if a child is sad, I mean, you know, kids are supposed to be sad. You know, it's an important thing. They have to learn that feelings and deal with things as they grow up, but how do we know as parents what the difference is between a child who's sad and some, a child who might have depression? You know, the answer is we don't know, which is why we have to rely on professionals. Um, of course, so the, the idea whole, that- I'm sorry, but the whole range of professionals is a challenging thing too. You have people who are really good at what they do and talking to kids and talking to parents and so forth, and you have some who uh, have some pretty uh, weird ideas and well, there's are, a are not all that effectual. It's, it's appalling. And it's really, really hard. And the truth, you know, Nick talked about having bipolar disorder. Nick started using, as he said, when he was 11 years old, and his drug use escalated. When it was became clear that he was in trouble, that's when I started to figure out what to do. And I didn't know what to do. I got a lot of bad advice. I um, ended up, Nick went in and out of treatment seven or eight times, maybe 10 times overall between inpatient and outpatient programs. He saw a lot of therapists. After 10 years, Nick had a relapse, he was doing better for a while, he had a relapse, and once again, he almost, he almost died, and uh, found a therapist somebody recommended to me, and we tried so many, but what else are we gonna do? So we went to see this therapist, she was a psychiatrist, and I, she met with Nick, somehow I got him to go there, and then she met with Karen, and me, my wife and I, and we sat with her, and she said, um, this boy's gonna die, unless we figure out what's going on with him. And she said, could I see his psychological testing? And I said, what? What's that? She said, do you mean that he's been in, you know, whatever, 10 programs, he's seen therapists, he's seen, no one has had him tested, no one had. As soon as he got tested, we figured out he had bipolar disorder, she put him on treatment for that, and, and uh, she, you know, between therapy and medication for bipolar disorder. Um, why didn't we find somebody that could have diagnosed that before, I think part of it is a failing of the system, that um, especially when you get in the drug-related system, that you've got people who's only training, uh, who somehow feel that they are qualified to treat drug addiction because they're sober. I mean, it's great that they're sober, but that doesn't mean they know what they're doing. Um, it's hard. And what do you think about the, because uh, a lot of kids really resent the fact that their parents, once their parents find out that maybe they're using whatever they may be using, that they pee test them, as they say. You know, you're gonna have to, Give me some of your urine and we're gonna get it tested. We're gonna find out if you're using and the kids feel that their privacy is encroached upon there and they get very angry many times. Yeah, and the question, I guess there's two pieces of that. One of them is that, you know, can parents accept the fact that sometimes their kids are gonna get angry at them because they're doing what they feel like they need to do, whether think whether you know a child feels like it's the right thing or not. One they also thing don't want to be discovered too. I, mean, I was gonna say, but the other thing is that there's a sense that the we are creating an atmosphere of distrust because we're yeah causing them to, you know, to take these tests. But the truth is, is what, it's, it, essentially it takes that distrust out of the package because we know what's going on. They know what's going on, we know what's going on. If a child tests positive, then maybe it's time for us to figure out what to do about it. If not, you know. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, some of the experts have told me that it's better to have, to take your child if you want to do that, if you're going to do um, testing, if you're going to do drug testing, to have a professional do it. So it's not setting up a dynamic at home where you're fighting with your kid and you're wanting to get your kid to pee at a cup. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's tough and it's not pleasant. Uh, but if you take them to a doctor and that becomes part of their, um, or a clinic, wherever they do that, and it becomes part of the routine and says, you know, we're worried about you, you know, I trust you, but I know it's hard out there. There's a lot of drugs out there. I know that, you know, you've struggled in the past. I know your friends are struggling. I just want to know. Yeah, Nick, how did you feel about that? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, uh, I guess by the time that it started, I, I understood where my dad was coming from. But um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there, I've heard this from parents a lot, actually, where they're like, well, I don't want my kids to feel like he's being, like, stigmatized or, like, I, by, in terms of, like, getting him into to see a therapist or, or I don't want him to feel like I'm, you know, being overly overbearing or 
But to me, it's like, there's no harm that's going to come in talking to a professional. I mean, the worst that's going to happen is you're going to waste, you know, 50 minutes of your kid's life. Or, you know, it's like, it's not, there's no negative thing other than just that, you know, it might not be helpful. But if it's not going to have any negative impact. So I think, you know, it's always better to sort of err on the side of, um, you know, of getting kids in to see somebody because, and but you're right, it's hard to navigate who is good and who isn't, but um, hopefully, you know, we'll sort of get better at, at being able to create a, a community around, um, you know, helping to, you know, each other to find the, the right kind of uh, treatment and, and the right doctors who aren't, you know, missing things like David, you want to well, all I was going to say is that it goes back to the question of testing, and, and it, it's, um, it's pretty risky. Nick talked about, um, you know, he mentioned fentanyl. Right now, somebody could just smoke pot, and it could have fentanyl in it, and they can die. You know, we were lucky because 10 years of Nick's relapsing and relapsing and relapsing and getting well, but, and relapsing um, and surviving. But I meet parents all the time who have a child who went out once or twice, and they took a pill, and it turned out that a pill that you know, they thought was one thing had, had fentanyl in it, and they overdose and they die. So I don't think we want to risk it, even if it means that we're not always going to be popular. Uh, easy to say again, mm -hmm. it's a dance, we're trying to figure it out. We, you know, we have to do it, everybody's different. It would be great if there were some guidelines that said, do this, do this, do this as a parent. It's not the way it works. Every family's different, every parent's different, every child's different. Um, and that's why part of the time, I think it goes back, we, maybe we keep saying the same thing, is that we need to get help. We need to get advice uh, to figure out how to navigate some of this stuff because it is really hard. And the dangers are real. The dangers are real. I mean, right now... The guidelines are you avoid the dangers as best you can and in whatever way you can. I don't want to yeah. sound like Machiavelli, but, you know, the yeah, reality best you can. Yeah. That's what you do. You and do as whatever parents, you can. And we're going to make mistakes as parents, and we have to let ourselves do that, but we have to keep trying and trying and trying. So another question for you, David, along these lines. Um, do you recommend rules for middle and high schoolers for alcohol and pot consumption? And if so, what would they be and what would be the consequences if those rules were broken? No rules. <laughs> Go for it. Um, no, of I, mean, if, I think that we definitely need to have rules. We definitely need to have expectations. Um, and, you know, again, we're here, let's look at the reality here, which is that it's, you, you, a child doesn't have to become addicted, like Nick did, in order to have incredibly dangerous and, and potentially life-threatening consequences. People get in cars all the time. You know, we're out in West Marin. There was somebody, um, it happened recently, that there was a car accident with four kids. Um, I think three of them died. Driver was high. You know, I think that we have a right to have, um, have expectations, and we have a right to figure out what those are. And in my opinion, again, what Nick is saying is that we want to postpone drug use as long as we can because of the impact potentially on someone's life, on their brain, on their developing brain. Um, and so uh, I think that we need to do whatever we can to, uh, per, uh, to postpone use if, we can, uh, if, if, we, if it's going to happen, we want to postpone it, uh, and obviously to prevent it. Um, and there's the two different things, postponing and preventing. Well, uh, they're really not, because what we do is we postpone and we postpone and we postpone, because the idea that we're going to be able to have one magic bullet when a child is 12 and protect them until they're 25, I mean, I wish we could do that, but it's just impossible. And so, no, we do have to kind of continue to figure it out, and there's going to be a new force, there's going to be a new, um, you know, it, this is... This is so, you know, pervasive. One of the things, again, I said this before, is that we're, you know, we're having this kind of conversation. We didn't used to have these conversations. The idea that, I mean, the only, you know, we couldn't see the whole trailer of the movie, but the cool thing about the movie, I mean, the movie was, you know, tra traumatic for both Nick and yeah, I think to watch it was, it was really, really hard, but it has, um, you know, raised the conversations all over the country. There was a, um, and, and so we understand, again, that, you know, the, how pervasive this is, how the dangers are, what the, pro the, the potential uh, problems are. Um, to talk about the ubiquity, uh, Daisy, our, our, my, my daughter, Nick's little sister, was at a, um, an art gallery opening, and she was in a group of people who I think she really admired. There was a famous artist there and a curator and from the museum and all that. And uh, by coincidence, one of them said, I saw this movie, Beautiful Boy, the other night, and it was, you know, so intense or whatever. And everybody in the, gr the group are these artists, and... We're talking about um, about the movie, and Daisy was sitting there thinking, you know, should I say anything? Or it's my family. <laughs> so finally, she sort of you know, screwed up the courage, and she said, um, uh, "She said that was my family." 
And then this famous artist who's, you know, who Daisy really admired said, I know that was my family too. <laughs> and then somebody else, somebody else in the group said, oh, that's my family too. The idea <laughs> is that, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. We don't talk about it. We don't realize that the person down the street, the person maybe in the next cubicle, the person, you know, our kids are, I mean, you know, this is, I know that Annie Lamott is a good friend of yours and, and um, somebody we all admire. And um, she says that, you know, we make our pain, our suffering worse because we always compare our insides to other people's outsides. Um, and it feels like, you know, we're the only parents out there trying to figure this out with our kids. We're the only parent who is drawing lines and we don't want our kids to use at all. We're the only one parent that isn't cool because we don't allow them to drink, use, you know, uh, when kids come over to our house, whatever it is, we're setting these rules. Uh, start talking to other parents, you realize that everybody is freaked out, everybody is scared, everybody wants the same thing, which is protect our kids. Yeah. Well, questions for both of you. Two questions for both David and Nick. High focuses on substance abuse and addiction. I think it is an incomplete picture to focus on the idea of addiction as a disease without acknowledging the origin, the cause of Nick's anxiety and stress, not fitting in, having an emptiness, a black hole. Filling this hole is what led him to pot and then meth. Why doesn't the book start with Nick having an untreated mental health problem that he handled by self-medicating? Is this related to the stigma of mental illness? Uh, that's, <laughs> that's an interesting question. This person should become an editor. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, to, to me, I think, uh, um, okay, to me, I think that what makes someone an addict is it's like a perfect storm of all these different things that come together. And there are definitely commonalities, but it's different for everyone. Obviously, everyone that becomes addicted doesn't have a co-occurring mental health disorder. A lot of us do, but not everyone does. Everyone that, not everyone that becomes addicted has, uh, has a genetic predisposition to uh, addiction. A lot of, you know, I know someone that's sober who there's no one else in her family that is addicted. Um, so there's things that can help us identify who is most likely to be, uh, become addicted. But, um, you know, there's no, uh, there's no one thing that makes everyone an addict. And, um, it, I w I, you know, in some ways I wish there was because it would be easier to, um, to identify in that sense. But, um, y you know, I think for me, um, the same way that there were sort of all these different things that came together to make me an addict, it's the same thing with sobriety. It's like there's all these different pieces of the puzzle that had to sort of come together to allow me to stay sober. And the mental health piece was definitely one of those pieces, you know, the getting on the right medication and finding the right doctor. But that was just one of the pieces. There's all these pieces, you know, in terms of, for me, you know, the 12-step program has been a huge thing for me. And, and um, you know, I wouldn't have the life that I have without it. Um, you know, it's also just sort of simple things like I've talked about, like, you know, going on hikes with my dogs or going to the beach or you know whatever i mean i think it really is like a puzzle and it's all these pieces that have to come together to allow me to stay sober and i think it's similar for addiction so your dad keeps talking about the external and the internal and uh, you know, i'm a literature professor so i look at things through often great literature in terms of what i can learn from there's a play that probably many of the young people here have never even heard of called long day's journey into night by eugene o'neill one of the great american plays and it's about many things, but it's also about addiction. Mary Tyrone, the main character, is addicted to morphine. And you come to the conclusion, and that I'm sort of prompted by this question, and the, that she becomes an addict in many respects because she can't get from life what she needs to get from life, or what she wants to get from life, or what she yearns or longs to get from life. And to some extent, to find those things, you said it very well, I think, before, that can fulfill you and make you feel less empty and give you joy and keep you active and keep you passionate, ideally, and intense with life in a vital way is sort of often the key. Yeah, and it really is different. I mean, I have a friend who's sober, um, and he's one of my closest friends. But when I talk about the depression that I feel, he's like, I don't know what that feels like. Like, he just, he's sober. He, he had a you know, terrible drug and alcohol problem but he's never dealt with depression in his life. It's so, so it's interesting. I mean, it's, everyone is, is different. And, um, you know, there's, it's, that's, you know, something that's frustrating about this disease is that there, you know, it is so hard to sort of pin down. But, um, you know, the 
great thing is I, I think that's why it's so important for us all to, to sort of share our stories because through our stories then we find commonality and um, you know it makes us feel less alone um, and more hopeful. Back to what your dad said about every family here are so many families and let me go back to you David with this final question. As father and son, do you believe that the parallel experience today for parents and youth is preventable even with a more pronounced culture of use? If yes, why? If not, why not? I do. Uh, I think that the reason we failed so miserably, the reason so many people are dying, the reason addiction you know, numbers are off the charts, the reason use uh, is so high uh, is because we have been thinking about this all wrong. You know, you brought up the just say no thing. Um, when we shift the way of we think about drug use as a symptom, when we understand that it's a symptom of other problems, I think then we will start to change, to turn the tide, change the trajectory of, 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 of lives. And that is to realize that it's a symptom of what, again, you know, um, what is stressing out our kids. We know that stress is related to drug use. We know stress is related to um, uh, other serious problems. Uh, mental illness, suicide, I mean, all these things are connected. And so once we start to identify the um, underlying reasons that people end up using drugs and having other, you know, that these problems escalate, uh, that's when we're going to start to make a difference. So that's why I'm hopeful, even though it's really hard. And, you know, you pointed out, how do you find a doctor even? You know, we live in a place where there's a lot of, you know, qualified people, but in, you know, what do you use? You know, use we also Yelp. have a lot of forces yep. that are so working against the kind of hope that you have, which is certainly cheerful and elevating to hear. But I'm talking about when you think about the opioid crisis, it's a crisis that was manufactured by some pretty greedy people and some dreadful it's people. It's horrific. And, and it, you think and it about ties in with doctors and it ties in with you know people just wanting to get rid of their pain and all of those kinds of things. It's it's a massive and complex problem. I'm talking about someone who has you know talked about it for many years now and just seeing the escalation get worse, the stress on kids like you talk about getting worse. But it's, it's elevating to hear you talk about that hope as if there is well, really a silver lining Well, and I think that, that goes here. back to some of the things we've talked about already, which is that this falls on who? You know, who's going to do it? You know, we are parents, uh, people in our communities, teachers. On, you know, teachers have a lot to do. We don't want to put more on them, but they are on the front lines. They're looking at these kids every single day. What about our pediatricians? You know, there was a survey done that parents brought their, 90% uh, 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 of pediatricians were not able to identify a drug problem in one of their patients. We bring our kids to our doctors, to our pediatricians to help them grow up, you know, figure out what's going on. You know, when did our, you know, bodies, become more important than our brains. You know, we're, we're, they're just like there's a physical every year. What about a mental health check? I mean, there, there's so much that we can do to try to figure out, help our kids figure out what's going on. Um, and then, you know, work together. You know, there's a community. I mean, one of the cool things tonight, again, is that it's not just schools, it's li not just libraries, but it's mental health professionals here, people who are trying to prevent um, uh, E-cigarettes, you know, what, what, whatever that's called, vaping. Um, working on that, uh, we're working, you know, people, are law enforcement working together instead of having this punitive idea that, you know, we have to lock people up. Instead, no, we realize that people who are having drug problems oftentimes just need help. They're, it's a health problem. We have to get them into the treatment system. I'm glad you um, mentioned vaping. So it takes though. a village. It takes, you know, uh, uh, all of us. No, it's the a cliche, community emphasis is great to hear, but I'm glad you mentioned vaping, too, because there are a lot of, there's a lot of culpability there. I mean, uh, the kind of advertising that was done, again, there was a sensibility a lot of kids had that this is not going to be as bad as nicotine, it's not going to be as bad as cigarettes, and it was uh, as much untruthful as the kind of stuff that came out from the tobacco companies. It just wasn't, I mean, lung diseases and all the kinds of things that followed. Um, maybe the best advice is just definitely say no. Well, I would say, say no to corporations. I feel like. Well, well I was going to say, you know, we say say no, K N O W, which means it's all about knowledge. It's about learning what we can, which is about you know conversations like this, uh, having it not just in a room like this, but in your community, in your school, bringing people together, uh, parents talking to each other. Um, that's really what you know. It's it, it. That's why ultimately, it's hopeful. Even though you're right, it's it's hard. We have a lot of work to do. Well, you two have done a lot of work, and you've certainly succeeded in educating so many young people and their parents and uh, I, I just want to close here with uh, 
thanking you, thanking you for being here tonight, for the work that you've both done. I think it's exemplary, and I think it's inspiring, and I hope that it will continue to be inspiring. Uh, say to all of you here tonight, you know, it, it does take a village. It's all of you working together and really trying to combat this because we are talking about something that is a battle. Good luck to have you who are here, and good luck. Thank you to David. Thank you to Nick.